Our first scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 6, 5 through 10. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our second reading, excuse me, is from Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. This is the word of the risen Lord. going through the Lord's Prayer, and today we come to that part of the prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Kingdoms might be difficult for us to understand because we don't live in a kingdom. We live in a democracy where our leaders are elected. They don't have absolute authority over all things. And so the idea of kingdom isn't our world. Kingdoms are where kings reign. Uh, for example, Saudi Arabia is a kingdom. Uh, the people there know they have to do what the king says. But that doesn't work here because the king of Saudi Arabia doesn't reign here. But where he reigns, well, there you find the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Where Jesus reigns, there you find the kingdom of God. And when we pray, uh, your kingdom come, we are praying for God to bring Jesus and the things of Jesus. Jesus probably taught and said more about the kingdom of God than anything else in all of his ministry. Jesus said the kingdom of God is coming with things that can't be observed. You mean I can't see it? I can't touch it? Well, how am I going to get it? No, he said, in fact, the kingdom of God is among you or within you or near you. Both John the Baptist and Jesus came preaching that people should reorient their lives because the kingdom of God is near. Jesus told parables to illustrate the kingdom. In fact, most of his teaching and speaking about the kingdom of God was in parables. He would say something like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he would tell a story. And he even said that the secret or the mystery of the kingdom is given in those parables. The kingdom is a mystery? Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God above all else. He said that it was the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. He said it was almost impossible for wealthy people to get into the kingdom, but that the kingdom belongs to children. Think about that. 
The scriptures say that after Jesus rose from the dead and he presented himself alive to his disciples, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And Jesus stood before Pilate and he said, My kingdom is not of this world. Well, we look around and it looks like the kingdom of God is about a million miles away. I mean, I see 500,000 dead from COVID. And I see people with cancer and nations in turmoil and famine and depression and anxiety and fear. And it sure doesn't look like God is reigning around these parts. And maybe that's why Jesus taught us to pray for the coming of the kingdom. You see, on the one hand, the kingdom has been established. Jesus has come. The king died and rose again from death and something new began. But there's a lot that still has to happen. And that final unveiling is yet to come. It's like, it's like God started the process in Jesus, but the world has yet to be fully redeemed. The kingdom has yet to be fully revealed. Perhaps it's like this. Uh, Nancy and my neighbor, Cliff. Cliff bought an old, beat-up Chevy pickup last year. Uh, he loves classic cars. It's a total disaster and a clunker. He had to, you know, tow it into his driveway. Uh, and I can't believe he paid too much for it. But I th think he's trying to restore it. I can't tell for sure because it's hidden beneath this cover of tarps. Uh, he works under there every day and uh, you see some activity going on and you hear the sounds coming from behind those tarps of the work. One day, I'm pretty sure, that covering's going to come down and Cliff is going to take that pickup for a drive and I'll bet that Chevy is going to shine. The rust is going to be gone. The dents are going to be worked out. The body will be like new. The parts are going to work to perfection. That engine is going to hum. Yeah, it's going to be something to see. But right now, the transformation is hidden. The work is undercover. It's being done with patience and steadfastness. Well, God's kingdom is hidden right now. It's coming slowly. It came with Jesus the King, but the kingdom has yet to be revealed in its fullness. We live in the tension of the already here, but the not yet. Uh, there are times when we get glimpses of God's reign, but there's a lot more to come that needs to come. And you know, Jesus said the kingdom is like a small, barely visible seed. He said, but it grows. It even grows amidst what is bad, amidst the weeds. Uh, Jesus recognized good and bad are taking place side by side, but he said that isn't for us to sort all of that out. God is going to sort that out one day. And when this small seed, the kingdom, grows, he says, it becomes the greatest of all the plants. Another time he says, you know, this kingdom, it's like yeast that you put into flour that, that um, you use for baking. It works silently, subtly, unseen, but, but you see it happen. Don't think just because the powers of darkness seem to be dominating that God's kingdom isn't on the move. The writer Philip Yancey said, God's kingdom advances slowly, humbly, like a secret invasion force operating within the kingdoms ruled by Satan. And we're praying for God's forces to come amidst the dark forces of this age. And the thing about the kingdom of God is that it's imperceptible. But God is bringing his kingdom underneath and amidst all the anguish and the distress and the misery of this world. It comes in spite of the wars and the terror. The kingdom cannot be stopped, even by a worldwide pandemic, even by the dysfunction in your own family. Christians have sometimes believed, well, if we can gradually Christianize the world, we'll eventually bring the kingdom. But the thing is, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we bring the kingdom. Everywhere in the Bible it says God brings the kingdom. 
the language of the prayer, don't we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's like, hallowed be your name. It's, it's a prayer for God to bring the kingdom. We are in essence asking or even telling God to do what only God can do. You bring your kingdom, God. You make it happen by your power. We are calling on you to do this. The language is almost like a command. We don't make the kingdom come. God makes it come. It's not the result of human progress or effort. It's the result of bowing down to the King, Jesus Christ. And so we pray for God's ways to prosper. Your kingdom come. Most important thing in a kingdom is the King. And the most important thing in the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ who is the King because the kingdom of God is anywhere where Jesus Christ is I mean there's a sense of that here this morning Christ is here we have a sense of God's reign when we believe in Jesus when we seek Jesus when we live for Jesus we are living in the kingdom the kingdom of God is the place not a geographic place but the place where we and where everyone does things God's ways and that honor him. That's where the kingdom of God is. But here's my problem. I put myself on the throne. I keep crowning myself King Phil and bowing down to Phil's system and Phil's reign instead of allowing Christ to be the center of my life. When we pray your kingdom come, we're praying for it to come not only in the larger world, but we're praying for the kingdom to come into our own individual hearts. Who rules your heart? God's kingdom comes whenever his ways are acknowledged and lived. Wherever there is love for those who are unlovable. Wherever there is forgiveness instead of seeking revenge. Whenever people praise or pray or live by faith. Whenever the hungry are fed or the naked are clothed or the lonely are visited. Whenever there's less of us and more of God. The kingdom breaks into our lives and into our homes and into our work. And into our neighborhoods even in this dark world. Which brings us to praying for God's will to be done. We pray this because it's a place, we live in a place where God's will is not always done. Jesus said, my food, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus said he didn't seek to do his own will, but he seeks to do the one who sent him. And he said, whoever does the will of my father in heaven, they are my mother and my father and my brothers and my sisters. And in one of his most staggering statements, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. C.S. Lewis put it like this. He said, there's two people in the world. Those who say to God, your will be done, or those to whom God says in the end, your will be done can't have it both ways. Either we submit to God and we say, God, your will be done. Or we live life on our terms and God says to us, okay, then your will be done. And see how that works out. It's the difference between heaven and hell. Because God doesn't force anybody to do his will. And sometimes God's way is the hard way. I mean, it was for Jesus. You think about it who did God's will perfectly. There's a book, maybe the Sassy Epiphany should read this book. It's by Wendell Berry, who's a, a, a wonderful writer. It, this book is called Jaber Crow. Jaber Crow was a barber in a little Kentucky farm town in this story. And Jaber always wanted to be a minister. He wanted to go study th th theology, but he ended up being a barber. It's funny, because I wanted to be a barber, but I ended up being a pastor. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Anyway, in the book, there's this part where Jaber Crow, he's reflecting on the Lord's Prayer and this part of the Lord's Prayer. And he says, one day, he says it hit him that Jesus' most fervent prayer was refused. 
Jesus prayed, Father, if, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, he prayed, not my will, but let your will be done. And Jaber Crow says this. He says, I must have heard that verse or read that verse a hundred times before without seeing or hearing. Maybe I didn't want to see it. But then one day I saw it. It just knocked me in the head. This, I thought, is what is meant by thy will be done in the Lord's Prayer, which I had prayed time and time again without thinking about it. It means that your will and God's will may not be the same. It means there's a good possibility that you won't get what you pray for. It means that in spite of your prayers, you are going to suffer. It means you may be crucified. You know, Jesus never asks us to pray anything he didn't pray himself. And in Gethsemane, in his darkest hour, on his face, facing crucifixion, Jesus prayed, My Father, if you can change the direction of this, please take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he didn't just pray it once, he prayed it twice, he prayed it three times. Jesus can tell us to pray, ask us to pray, your will be done, because it is how he prayed. And sometimes that's not an easy prayer. I mean, Jesus is honest before the Father in Gethsemane. He asks to be corrected if he's wrong. He says, Father, if that's not what you want, then confirm it for me. He's been there too when we've prayed that prayer, your will be done. It's a prayer of submission. Your will be done. It is to put our life in God's hands and to say we will let him govern the world and our lives as he sees fit. That we want him to work his way. That we want him to work in our lives as he wants. That we will trust him and love him through it no matter what comes. Now, having said that, I don't want us to think that praying this part of the Lord's Prayer, praying God's will, is merely resignation to what is hard. Praying for God's will to be done can also let loose things that are bound. It can open doors. It can change circumstances. It can bring grace and peace and hope. It can bring the life and the power of God. It's just that when all is well and great in our lives, we don't struggle with God's will, do we? It's when things are hard in adversity and challenge. That's when we struggle with God's will. But in God's will is our peace. Hear that. In God's will is our peace. And by asking us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, Jesus has invited us to join in the praying for the coming of the kingdom and what God wants in this world and in our lives because it first comes with prayer. That's why Jesus said to pray like this. And I pray that Jesus will reign, be the king in my life and in your life and in this church and in this world. And I pray that what God wants uh, I pray that what God wants will be done in my life, in your life, in this church, and in this world. And I pray that we will see God's kingdom and we will see the presence of the King breaking into each one of our lives as we keep praying that together. Let's pray. Thanks be to you, God, that we can surrender our will and our lives to yours. Thank you that the sacrifice is worth it when it comes to you because we can fully place our life in your hands. There are many things we don't understand, Lord, many things we struggle with. So help us to trust you. And Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come and your will be done in our world, in our lives. Make it happen. You do it. Amen.